Ropecón. Uh, 
or so, and they asked me to join there, and uh, I was thinking, well, this board game thought is fun as well, so I wasn't sure, but then I jumped in, and so I've been working for five years in Supercell, so far doing then mobile games, uh, and uh, that's basically it. So board games and mobile games, that's my background. But as a game gamer, I've been playing a lot of play games for a long time, and uh, PC games, and that kind of stuff as well. Uh, I'm Reko uh, I've been working in the game industry for something like 13 years. My, my background is on the like graphic design and stuff, and I, I started my, my kind of gaming hobbies with role-playing games and all those, and then obviously started writing my own stuff as well. And uh, my history board games is that I, I basically got hooked on those around late, late 90s. It was the settler of Catan gateway drug thing which caught me. I passed that now, luckily. Uh, then I, I've been, been to a few game companies in Finland. Uh, I think Digital, digital Chocolate was the one that was the most kind of, uh, important in terms of like, physical versus uh, digital stuff because we used to do a lot, of, a lot of mobile games there and one of the best ways to get your ideas through and teach things was to actually show the prototype. Like even showing the goal with the, like a gameplay prototype that was done on like as a board game. And for some projects it worked really nicely and then on some it's, it's, it wasn't that useful to do. But that was like, it was, at least for me, I got a really good like batting average in terms of how many of my pitches actually became like game, actual digital games and a lot of those were due to the fact that they were kind of like we prototype them on like paper and dice and all that kind of stuff. Which sounds really weird because you it kind of feels that they're like two different worlds but they're not necessarily that. Uh, nowadays I work that uh, seriously we go again called best things. Uh, yeah that's it. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Jussi Alvia. I've also been in the game business now for 11 years. Uh, my background actually in gaming was a big deal since I was 5 or 4. Uh, I did uh, program games when I was in high school, but uh, ever since, since that I've been more, more of a designer. Uh, designing board games started the, around the turn of the millennium. I have been game, board gaming since the late 90s as well. Uh, also role playing games uh, since the late 90s. Uh, and then uh, in 2006 I started my first game company, which I ran six years. During those years I think that this whole topic, digital versus uh, physical, was the most relevant. Because, well, we worked, uh, we were a seven, seven people team. We worked not only with board games, not only with uh, online games, but we also made mobile games when iPhone came out. Uh, but we also work with uh, with the uh, BGT, the Finnish uh, what's BGT in English? I don't know. The Research Center. So we did uh, um, like physical games using printed electronics, which was pretty cool, cool to explore uh, different possibilities that uh, printed electronics would have. We also work with uh, one company doing embedded systems, so board games with embedded systems, uh, which. Also paid the bills. That wasn't as, as uh, successful as at the BTP project. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, then I switched jobs. I uh, planned and designed a game uh, game initiative called Old Game Lab, which I ran for two and a half years. Uh, during with, during which I also joined in to uh, lead a company called Viva Games, uh, where I stayed only for one and a half games. So before the second game was launched, I left to my current current company, or where I nowadays work, uh, meaning the Reborn, or former Fragment production. In Vima, uh, the biggest success was naturally the first game. We got 25 million downloads, mobile free-to-play game. Uh, and in Reborn, the first game is still on the works and should come out on January. So that's my background. Uh, hopefully, we will uh, see some insight on how digital and physical meet. Yeah, thank you for all the panelists. I'm really happy to have you here. You're all like um, sort of idols in this uh, 
game design for me. And uh, uh, people, uh, most people, clever of you might have noticed we have one missing, and it's uh, probably because of the uh, in Finland. Fin Finland is the best country to work on games, and we have these big things called summer vacations that mess things up. So we have one that is missing. Uh, there's two of us here. I, don't, I tried to find him, but he didn't. No. Okay, he couldn't make it then. <laughs> so we had an organic panel here. Few changes. But yeah, thank you and welcome. It's really awesome to have you here. Uh, I'm by no means a uh, professional in uh, physical games, board games, and like uh, I designed one board game. It was amazing. You should see it. But it made me really think about this uh, subject. And uh, like here in one panel, actually, it was a presentation about the differences of in, in, board, in digital games and like physical games, uh, how the computer uh, follows the rules and how, how players actually feel the rules when you have uh, uh, different uh, platforms, if you, if you could say. Uh, talking about physical, physical, physical and digital games as well. And so, um, well, let's, let's let's start with the typical one. Um, so, what's it, what is what do you think is the main difference between the physical and digital games? And now we are talking about developing game, those games. And do you have do you have like any like insight on this? Matter? What do you think? Well, certainly with the physical stuff, it's quite easy to do. Like fast loops, fast interactive loops. You can you can just mishmash stuff together and see if it works. Whereas in uh, the digital shop stuff has gotten faster because of Unity and all these like remade game engines. But it still it still takes takes a while because with the digital stuff, a lot of it requires like really good feedback. Like when a when a player does something, you should get like feedback out of it so that you can kind of feel feel good about things. Then on, on board games, I think the kind of even when you're prototyping something that, that looks really crappy, you have that kind of social interaction there. So you see reactions from people and you can crack jokes. So it kind of changes the situation a bit more. But there is the old saying with the digital uh, game creation that if you want to be like as fast as possible, then, you, then your actual prototype should look like shit. But then if you're trying to sell your project and get funding, it can look like shit. But then if you pretty something up, and if the actual game doesn't work, then everyone falls in love with the fact that it looks really pretty. So yeah, we can make it work later. And that's a dead sentence for the actual development process, because it never works on it. So it's a balance. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I just want to repeat. Uh, the main, main point uh, is indeed that you can just snap fingers when it comes to physical games and change the rules. If you see that it's broken, that okay, this needs to be fixed. You don't have to uh, have programmers programming for a week to make a radical change. You can just decide, okay, this was this didn't work, so let's change the rules. So the whole process is a lot faster. You you get to iterate faster when it comes to working and development. Yeah, usually the teams doing digital games are much bigger, and that's what a huge challenge. If you can do something just in your head and with your own hands, everything is in your control, but it usually like the, how digital games are made is that there's like a big thing working together, so there's a lot of challenges related to that. And uh, also, of course, all those opportunities, because then you can get this chemistry between people and everybody can feed to the game by plus ideas. Of course, that can happen as before games as well, but uh, but you should, many times board games are more like a solo project or dual project from the design perspective of this. And uh, I think from the uh, experience side, it's, it's a different thing to, in many, I, I, there are a lot of similarities of course, but I think it's quite different to uh, think about like, when you do, at least for me always, the biggest uh, like a surprise, so to say, when you do board games is that the experience is so much tighter than like, the physical uh, action that you are doing. Like if you are drawing a card or doing stuff like that. Sometimes you can think in your head that okay, this is how the game plays out, and then you then you do, do the design and, and work it up, and, and it just feels crap. Like it's something in the physical action that you are doing is not like it doesn't just 
work. And uh, that's one big part that is difficult to see. But on the other hand, on the digital side, there's a lot of this UI experience, like how the game looks, how the usability is, what's the feedback. And those are really tied, I think, to the game design as well, but they are quite separate and work in different ways, both, both, both kind of genres of both types. And maybe uh, one goes from the game design, like the rules perspective, the digital games, the game, as you said, I think, was that uh, the game kind of enforces the rules by themselves, whereas, whereas in board games, players need to enforce the rules and make sure that everything works. So, of course, making those rules that are very transparent and very um, clean and somehow the players can do that, it's very important. Whereas maybe it's not as important in these games. Yeah, and I think uh, that's a very, very good point. And point that you make uh, that in board uh, games, if, uh, if like, the game doesn't force you to play it right, so you need to be very clear Whereas with, if the digital game is uh, in the works and if the player feedback is missing or, or something is not polished, then it frustrates the player a lot more than in a, a digital game. Uh, sorry, a physical game where the others are also trying to figure out how to, how to make this work. Of course, if uh, that's the case, board game because it's very competitive as well because one guy can or girl can make a game, then uh, you can't have. Not, not finished products, also in board games. So in that sense, learning how to deliver uh, the rule set as well as how the art should support that the players know how to play board games, that's a very good uh, uh, kind of practice also for digital games where the art should uh, tell that, okay, if I press this button, this thing happens, and this is the feedback that the player gives uh, back to the players. So. How do you guys see, like, when you develop board games versus developing with a team on a digital game, like on, on the digital side, like the whole team should be basically ready to say that this will scrap or there's something like there's always that something that nags you and then you're gonna have to figure it out how you're gonna fix. But then do you guys feel that when you do board games that you're gonna get this syndrome where you play you just this one guy sitting in the tall tower? And kind of as dribbling rules and trying to get it to work, and kind of like, do you think that you get enough cycles for the actual feedback on the rest of or is it a bit of a hurdle because you have to do play testing sessions and get people together? And so, you, you mean, do you get enough feedback in board game? Yeah, I know, yeah, the digital way it's like constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I guess it depends how much you do play testing, right? But mm -hmm. if you do it a lot and enough, then, then, then you get, but if, if you don't, then can, it's easy to develop a game without getting the feedback that's in this way, but yeah, usually yeah. those games are crappy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just like, do you kind of find the point that, okay, I might spend enough time yeah. with myself, so let's, yeah. let's get this out. And yeah, and about one, one advice I would give for all board game designers is to get the game out there for test sessions as early as possible, because if you just develop it on your, on your own without any, con any contact with other, other people, then it, as Toto said, it's going to be crap. And the faster you can start getting the crap out of the game and making it great, the, the better. And uh, usually that just requires a lot of testing, a lot of uh, revisions, and a lot of, uh, lot of changes. Yeah, getting back to what you said about the feeling or sensation of playing a physical game. So when you compare that about, uh, when you think about the sensation of, say, uh, Hearthstone, so. I think one of the great things about Hearthstone is how card game -ish it feels. So, is it something that's worth pursuing in digital games? Is there worth how is it rather should, should be done, basically? Uh, yeah, I, I guess in the Hearthstone cases it should be like a card game because it presents so much like a card game. But I think it should feel right, whatever the right is, but it, it depends so much on the game. But, but yeah, this, the, what is very important in digital games is that I think many people miss is that UI needs to be really, really responsive. And the, like, if you do an action, you need to get response because it's lacking the haptic, haptic feedback or whatever. Like, you don't get any, any uh, sensation from the touching anything. So you have to over exaggerate the uh, visual feedback in order to compensate that. So the players feel that they are actually doing actions and getting feedback. And, and 
you can see a lot of games that are missing the missing the visual feedback, and I think that's super important. And but Hearthstone does pretty well. There's a lot of visual feedback. Yeah, speaking of Hearthstone, I think it's it's a good question, and right? I think especially with the digital or digital, because like, well, how many here have played Hearthstone? Probably a lot. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, it, it, I, I find it like really interesting, like given the yeah, okay, Blizzard develops a card game, and Blizzard has done a lot of like online stuff, and everything's they 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 know every, all of it. So then, like, what do they decide to do on Hearthstone in terms of what actually transmits from one, one player to another? So okay, they don't do any chats, they just do like yeah, good game and that stuff. But then the really interesting details are like. For example, when I'm playing against another player, it obviously tracks like if I if I hover my mouse or my finger over the uh, cards, and the cards gonna lighten up and they're gonna enlarge a bit, and that's exactly what the other player sees as well. So it's almost like you have two guys with, with the deck of like cards like this, and then you have that bit of like kind of like the tag talk kind of someone's kind of like looking at the cards and then the, the order is the same so you know that these cards here are the oldest and these are the ones he just drew and there's actually if you play in the kind of really high ranking Hearthstone games that is basically the tell that you can actually get an idea of the other player based on like what he does when it's not his turn and when he's kind of like thinking about what to do next he will kind of go through his cards and he, you can kind of see that there is this way that he's kind of looking at these cards now so he's been holding on to them for a longer time and so on and so forth and I, I just love that kind of detail and it's not it's not the most visible feedback you see but then in terms of how the game works it's like just fantastic it's such a small deal that you're gonna miss if you imagine that there's like a ton of game design documentation that there's only this one thing in the world. Like let's make sure that the other player sees what you're doing with your deck. So, yeah. I just wanna uh, say something I forgot. So if you have any questions uh, during this presentation, uh, I think I think we're good to take them uh, even during the presentation. If you have anything that uh, really catches your fancy that or you, you don't get points, just lift your hand. So, um, straight away. Oh yeah. Oh, um, okay. Just yeah. I'll, I'll first people. Uh, I, I just have a small addition to that part still thing that you didn't mention, and that is the uh, excellent sound design it also has, because it has things like voice clips for every single card when you attack with them, which kind of add the feedback, and you wouldn't get that in a normal card game, of course, but it kind of adds another layer of like something is happening to like there's like a uh, what maybe for sorry, but it tells the player that something's happening. You attack with the card, it makes a sound. You play your card, it makes a sound. You draw a card, it makes a sound, and it like keeps giving player feedback on that level as well. Yeah, there is a level of branding for Blizzard as well, for well, like long time Warcraft fans. So it's kind of like that, especially the world of Warcraft stuff, like all the all the Murlocs and stuff like it's. It's really irritating, but people love it. Do you have any? I'm just trying to activate you more. Thank you for the question. So, do you have any other games that you feel you played, digital games that feel really tactile? Any? You can just pull out. Because I think that Hotstone is like a really good example, and it just. I, I, I was quite amazed when I played it. It was like, oh, this actually feels like a card game, and so on. Um, but no. Um, so, just kind of like, okay, let's kind of do move from Hearthstone to the others. So, what's kind of like the general consensus about the <coughs> every board game designer doing digital versions of their board games? Because, like, this, like, I was just following Rainer and Nizia on that Twitter, and then I realized when I was looking at his tweets, that roughly every uh, every ten days there is an Nitsia release in a digital format or, or some kind of Nitsia release. And I was following his Twitter feed like down, 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 and there's like just like tons of it. So obviously the guy has designed a lot of games, so there's a lot of bandwidth to do that. But at least for me, like most of the board game kind of conversions into like an iPad format, they're just like I don't know, they just feel like big shit to me. There's even some games that I don't even get on iPad when I get them on like 
for example, the hardware is like, I, I've played the board game version fine, and I've played the iPad version, it's a bit like, what's going on? So, <laughs> <laughs> there, are, yeah, there are some fun directions, I, I kind of agree with, with you on that, but yes, especially on small world, I think it's, it's beautiful, yeah. iPad version and works nicely, and, and Agricola as well, it's very good app, and uh, to get to ride, get to ride yeah. Gorgas. Yeah, I would play Gorgas. Yeah. Gorgas. Yeah. 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 But I think all of those are actually, yeah, all of those games actually have a fairly good amount of development behind them. Yeah, so they're going to take the platform into consideration. Yeah. And some games, they work much better in the, in, the, in the digital format. Like, there are a lot of, in, for example, like the Eclipse as an example, there's a lot of digital version of that. And I think one of the problems, even though it's well, overall, I think it's well made, and but there's just one. One problem related to that uh, kind of passing and, and uh, that it happens very naturally in the board game format, but it's very clumsy and, and slow in the digital, digital version because you have to wait actually to do their passing. And, and that kind of stuff that you don't really think about in the board game language because their structure is, is, yeah. is one way. But when you when you implement in the digital format, it actually becomes a problem. And I think that's the gathering. I think it actually is a very good example of different parts from started as a how to, you know, not started, but, but it was one of the main things, how to solve the problem with, with magic where, where you have these uh, instant counters and that because they kind of break the rhythm, but ours took the direction that there's nothing like that, you can always do your turn and then the next turn, there's no like interaction between the turns and those kind of small things, you will know, think about when you do the you know, uh, physical version of the game, that this might be a problem on, on a digital side, but yeah. sometimes all things can become a problem on the digital side that you don't really think about. Yeah. And I think actually like some of the digital conversions can, there's this thing called war of impetus <laughs> in, in board games, so you kind of, if you don't have anything to do what the player is doing this, then you just wait, 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 wait. And obviously like when you are designing board games, like that's one of the things to keep, keep in mind, like what can you do when it's not your turn? I think some of these digital, digital counterparts actually reintroduce that to the games when you are like someone, some AI or something is doing his turn and you just like, come on. Yeah, yeah and I think in the digital format, the downtime is even worse. Uh, yeah. in, in board games, if you play in face to face, then usually there is some fun chatter that, yeah. that makes the problem a bit less. But if it's indeed on the iPad and you wait for someone else's turn, you're on the front. Please, please make your turn away. Just checking Facebook, like what well, somebody is doing. Yeah. The, the, that is one of the biggest problems for me in board games. Like you getting bored, or your epic plans getting crushed during other people's play. And I, that, that's I, personally for me that's kind of sensitive part of the term structure. Like how to keep it interesting even during the play sessions. But I think you had a question. Well, not really questions. I thought I. I really liked Settlers of Cotton as a board game, and I recently downloaded the app, and now I know why I didn't like the game as an app, because everything that, you, like the tactile feedback is completely missing. So, thank you for the input, in a way, and now I know why I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, we are, please hold the mic, you can pass it. Okay, we have a question there, actually. I can try with the... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was asked to pass the mic, so, because they are recording everything you say for NSA, so... <laughs> or somebody else. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I ask you to pass the mic on. So, um, is this on? Hello? There's that uh, on the switch. <laughs> So uh, I like playing Dominion much better in the dig, 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 digital version <laughs> because it's much faster and easier to play. So in, at least in that game, the downtime is actually, in my opinion, uh, much less in the digital version than in the physical version. So it's, it's played much faster. I have played with my friend like five minutes games where I think the physical versions that would be practically impossible. So. Yeah, it's the deck building aspect of it. To get to shopping, yeah. Yeah, shopping, shopping, shopping. Yeah. I, I played like, I think my count on small world on iPad is something like 600 games or something like that. And it plays way faster than the actual board game, but I don't like the board game. It definitely like it. Every platform has its strengths in a way. And, and Board game is a bad platform, you can think that way, and it has its own strength, and the digital side has its own strength. And if you try to uh, do a, let's say, 
initial version, some games just the transition is much better because then it plays with the strength of the platform. And I, in case of Dominion, for example, it's a good, good example of that, that. You can get rid of the deck building and shuffling and all the stupid things. That actually leads to the next. Uh, sorry, did I? Yeah, yeah. That leads to the next question. I was just thinking about uh, what do you think are the biggest strengths of the, uh, say, board gaming platform and let's call it card games uh, too. So uh, okay, well, it's yeah. it's, it's a hard to talk. Many games are both, but anyway, what what is the biggest strengths of like, so got, like developing? Uh, actually, not even developing. Like, what is the point of those games? <laughs> <laughs> For me, uh, board games and card games, the biggest strength is that definitely that they can tackle uh, topics that uh, would be impossible to tackle uh, in digital world, world because it requires small, smaller teams when it comes to board games. Like uh, Sumatra, you can ha hunt endangered species, which is like uh, if it was a uh, Digital game, it would cause an out outrage. That what the fuck? They're hunting endangered animals in a jungle, and when the natives try to save, uh, save them, then you you push them away, uh, and that wouldn't be possible in uh, digital games. It, it would require a bigger team, and I would say no one would take the risk of the backlash uh, that that would come come with it. So in that sense, the kind of author uh, industry, when it comes to uh, board games, is is fun because you can find all sorts of games get, uh, from the physical world. So maybe uh, are you saying that they're more abstract as a game, so people can how, how can it? Not necessarily. Like they are, of course. The, the, I, I'm a big fan of the uh, German German style games, not the Ameritrash games mm. so much. Mm. And though I'd say one of my games was Ameritrash game more, uh, but uh, more as as the themes that they they put into the games. There, there can be, of course, there is the, uh, lots and lots of historical games, which is fine for me as I like history, but uh, uh, but at the same time you can find very very different uh, themes. Uh, sometimes they're relevant for the gameplay, uh, sometimes they're not. But, uh, but I think that's a fun aspect still. You can find almost anything. But is that because of the business aspect of it? Like, because, like, obviously, like, you don't, like you are, let's hunt all the endangered species until they're extinct. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily set that well on the like, digital side of games, but then if you're kind of like an out there uh, board game designer, then the actual, you can do it and you can actually get it done with fairly good like visual representation, but you're still not, you don't need to sell like 20 million copies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's a bit the same as the, uh, if some if in the literature, if uh, a single book would have to sustain 20 to 50 people, then you would get a lot less topics covered because it, it would need to sell always a lot, a lot of copies. Of course, most board games are hobby, hobby projects. Very few can uh, earn a living out of it, but but still there is enough people that that want to get their games out there. So there's also many many different uh, experiences out there for us us to gain. Yeah, as a platform, uh, one big thing that board games have on the side is in a way is the multiplayer aspect. It so naturally fits the board game, and so not so naturally fits the digital game. So if you think about it, actually, I don't, almost all games are, at least historically, they were single player digital games. And there are some multiplayer where you play uh, next to each other on, on the same computer. There are those as well. But it's like a pretty modern thing that you actually play online. Well, not that modern, but like as a big, big uh, phenomenon. It's, it's, uh, it's not so yeah. natural for the design. Now it's transition and maybe has been more happening to us that, well, I think, well, maybe not. It's not. Maybe it's always been there, but in a way, like, board games always are multiplayer games with very limited amount of people playing together on the same table. And that rarely happens actually in a, some of us maybe. In our example, like three versus three or five versus five, where you have like a relatively small people yeah. playing on the same in, in, in the same game. That's quite rare on the business side. <coughs> yeah, I was I was still awake at 1:30 a.m. last night. We were playing yesterday with like there was what was it like some other guys. And I just remember the cursing stick because we were on this top right rail and it wasn't going well. So everyone was getting quite tired. So that was quite <laughs> so hearing some random people curse. So yeah, I was, I was just thinking about that. I, I 
I've been playing all the formats lately, I don't know why. And it's like, I'm not cursing that can happen in this game okay, when you're not sitting together. But I've never seen that kind of like a rage and softness <coughs> in a board game session or card game session or have you. I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little different thing when you actually uh, are with those people. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess like, just kind of like, Guessing, but actually a lot of those kind of digital multiplayer games, they're actually super competitive in a way. Like it doesn't have to be PvP, but it can even be PvE where you are just attempting something and it's not kind of coming together. Certainly you can have kind of like the role playing aspect of MMOs that <coughs> I used to do that for years. So that's because you want, then you want power gaming. But yeah, for board games, it's, it's then it's more like a player type. Thing. Like you have like ultra competitive board gamers, then you have gamers who just like they just like to play and not just <laughs> So yeah. yeah, but I'd still say that board games are, I'd say, at least as competitive because apart from a couple of cooperative board games, which usually they suck, they can at least I don't like most of them. Uh, it's still like the competitive element is still there. That uh, yeah. if if anyone is open, like perfectly fine, I don't care. <coughs> then what's the point of playing? What yeah. aspect? Of it? But yes, yeah, I totally yeah. agree that it's not as yeah. the people don't take it as serious as in as yeah. a digital game. But but there is still the same competitive element. It's true, but I think it's a different topic. Like it's the Knizia's all saying that uh, the goal is to win, but it's it's not really fair.
becoming a physical property. Like, for example, Battlestar Galactica, the TV series, becomes Battlestar Galactica, the board game. And what, are the, what is the business and what are the tricks and the tools and the rules of the trade in this subject? Do you have any ideas? Do you mean more like a business perspective or how, how do you handle the IPs? Oh, oh, why to make these uh, physical versions, these board games, and how to make these physical work versions, these board games, and so Yeah, I, like, um, when it comes to licensing, uh, I don't know about Battlestar Galactica, but uh, like for the Video game companies, there is like lots of licenses that we could use if we just are willing to either go for revenue share or, or pay for the license. Uh, but at the only personal experiences that I know from board games I don't, on this topic is with the Kuznia uh, Gear company from Poland who made the Witcher board games. Uh, and as far as I know, they just happen to know the guys and know also the comic artist and then they just uh, agreed with the with the CD project who if I understood right that they had all the gaming rights at the, at the moment and then they went out for a beer and they made a Witcher uh, board game as well so it, in that sense naturally with all licensing if you have an own brand then it helps getting the shelf space it helps get people remembering what the game was if it was some, some like if I made similar game as the Witcher board game called Noituri, for example, nobody would have heard of it. It's uh, difficult to get anyone to uh, sell it and so forth. But if it's a Witcher, then it, everyone on Witcher, so so it makes sense to use non non brand if, if you have an opportunity. From the business business perspective, I think mostly it's to sell more board games. <coughs> Not the other way around. I don't think it's usually, but it can, yeah, you can sell more copies if you have a good brand. And from the design perspective, I think one of the benefits if, if you have is also limitation, but it's, it can be a benefit from the uh, learning perspective and from the immersion perspective, so that players who start playing the game, they already know what's the game about. Maybe it's easier to learn the rules, learn the characters when they can, they have something they can kind of relate to. They know already the setting. So it can be a really good thing, like in Battlestar Galactica, I think it's a perfect example. Without the team, without the IP, the game would be so much worse. Yeah, in practice. <laughs> no, it's pretty. Yeah. yeah, and I think from a business perspective, I would imagine that actually the board game design has a, or whoever designs it or has an idea of like, let's, let's do this. I think the advantage is on, on, on that side, because obviously the video game developers, I think, rarely have the luxury to think about anything but the digital version. So they might actually just like not even think about the board game version. There's been a surprising amount of like IP based board games which have turned out quite well and it's been interesting to read about them from the designer's perspective on how they kind of approach the challenge of creating a board game version of this. So I think it's a, it's a really fertile ground in that sense. Yeah, I think uh, uh, what, what you said is uh, uh, what you asked basically. There is uh, the physical games, the uh, digital games, they're so, the platforms are so different, but the IP is one of the things that only binds many games together because the board game has to be so different, the digital game has to be so different because they have different strong grounds. So the IP is often, like always, I think it would be a really bad game if there's more common than IP between a board game and a game in general. I don't know. But uh, let's have a next question then. So there have been board games that have blurred the line of digital and physical board games, with XCOM, the board game, being one of the more successful ones, uh, where you have to use a phone, tablet, or a PC to play the game. So. Uh, there's a two-part question. What do you think, uh, if you're making that kind of game where you kind of use a phone or a tablet or a PC to play the board games, what are the minimum requirements or minimum features you need to use to kind of make it acceptable to, uh, you know, require
require the player to use a phone, for example. And um, do you think that uh, is it okay to make it like mandatory or optional to use that kind of you know, device? So should the player be able to play the game with just physical components? Or can, can you make it like mandatory like an XCOM? Well, well, I think it's up to the up to the IP in this case. Because uh, particularly if, if the board game is directed for hobbyists, which is not, in most countries, is not big business, if you make it also mandatory to have this, uh, then you're also limiting the amount of people who might be buying it. And if it's not a big IP, uh, then the shops will just think that, okay, but then they would need to also have a smartphone, particularly if it's not on all, both Android and uh, iOS, then it gives the store more often the chance to say, or the publisher to say, no thanks. Uh, so in that sense, I, I would be, what? I'd say that uh, it needs to be a big enough IP, big enough project uh, to make sense, to make it compulsory. But the, uh, the Czech games, what's the Alchemist? Not, not the Alchemist, but the Space Alert. Yeah, Space Alert. Space Alert is smart because every, you can count on that uh, everyone has a CD player at least. So that, I'd say that doesn't limit uh, any of the buyers. But, uh, well, maybe at the moment, Maybe smartphones already are so common that now it's no longer that kind of co question that uh, will it limit. But it's still, it's still half the point that uh, when board games aren't sell, so, sold that many copies, that is there an excuse for the shop to say or the publisher to say no? Yeah, and I think XCOM is probably the only one with like a mandatory requirement. But then there's like there was the what's the new. Uh, the way a wolf can like one another one from yeah, because that's that basically makes the the GM is basically the well, essentially if you download the app, but it's not mandatory to have. But it's still like, it would be interesting to hear how the XCOM has done because it is actually kind of paving the way mm -hmm. it sounds a bit threatening, or like not threatening, but kinda of like yeah, it's a it's off sell. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's tough sell, but on the other hand, I, I kind of think like usually the, those additional features, they just distract and add fitness and add. Mm -hmm. So in a way, if you're going to add a, a mobile device to your board game, I think it's almost, it would be maybe better that it's really integrated so it can bring something new to the game. Like Alchemist, I think it's a good example of, uh, it, it really needs the app or needs something that, I don't know if you have played this, this is a game where you have a hidden information and no one can really know it, but the, the, the phone knows the, like, the real thing. And it gets, it's an interesting, like a completely new thing that you cannot do only on a whole board. I guess you can, but it would be so difficult. So it adds something new to the mix. And when that happens, that can be interesting. So in a way, I would maybe even reverse and say, if you can do it, then do it properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's definitely yeah. yeah. Don't do it as a gimmick on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, uh, can I? Um, the first, first part of the question was what kind of, what, what are the features that, if, if, uh, for example, I'm making a game which uses a mobile phone, what are the kind of features that need to, well, what are the things I need to use the phone for to make it like acceptable to have the phone? Do you know what I mean? So that it won't be distracting but it adds value to the play, the game. Yeah, I guess if it adds some unique new element to the gameplay that cannot be done without the, without the device, like hidden information that no one can access, that's something that is tough to do without, without something like that. So more, more of adding some kind of gameplay element other than not just counting how many life points you have. Or Correct, yeah. Yeah. So did you have a question there? Can I pass the mic? We can, follow, we can follow your question a little later to the towards digital games. Um, what makes them shine? Not crisp. Yeah, kind of returning. So, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, kind of coming back to the licensing thing. Uh, when bringing something that is originally digital, for example, Witcher or Bioshock or XCOM, uh, what should one uh, kind of focus on when designing the game? 
for example, should he, uh, should you uh, try to bring the gameplay elements uh, or the, just the general feel of the original IP, or should you go for a new direction only using like the skin of what you're doing? Well, I think that's actually, this answer probably holds true to any IP, like depending, like if you are given an IP and, and you do something with it, like for example, if you're doing like a, you take a graphic novel and you want to make a movie out of it or a, any kind of a mix, and I, I think the important point is to like really dig down to like what is this thing at its core, like what are the most important values in this thing. So that way, like when all the fans gonna get to it, they can kind of recognize that yeah, this actually feels like that, or you know, this feels like that. So for example, with Battlestar Galactica, they have that kind of like obviously you have to you have to have Cylons there. They have to be a traitor there, like because you don't know who is a Cylon. So all of the, those things have to kind of tie into it. So I, I would I would definitely start from that, like what are the kind of like three, four, four things in this whole thing, and then after that, kind of like start thinking like what. What kind of game does come out of this one? Yeah, and while doing it, make sure that it's supported by the platform. That if, the, if it's a real time game that you want to bring in board game, indeed, pick, pick up that, uh, uh, that core thing, but don't try to force it to be, for example, real time if your gameplay idea doesn't work real time. And don't just Transfer the IP, uh, transfer the gameplay, and expect it to work. But IP you can transfer, but the gameplay probably not. Yeah, I agree completely. The gameplay is usually very difficult to if you change from one platform to another platform properly. So you can, usually it doesn't make sense. But sometimes you can uh, have the same feeling with the mechanic. It can kind of be the same or be natural, even though it's completely different. But that, that's something that you can try to. And I said from the team's perspective, or from the learning the rules and understanding everything, you can still convey the feeling and, and the atmosphere and everything. And I guess also, like, if you think about it, like, let's assume that you don't have the IP and you are like, okay, there's like, you want to do a board game out of Stranger Things or something like that. So then, like, probably Netflix hasn't thought about it, or maybe it has, but you, you are, imagine that you are the guy who walks into the meeting room with the guys. Then you are pitching like, okay, so I want to make a board game out of Stranger Things. How would you pitch that so that all the Netflix guys feel that, well, yeah, okay, I actually think that he actually gets the IP and he gets what Stranger Things is all about, you know, that, that, so that also ties into it. Okay, there's a question back there and the next one there. I, have, I still have like three big, big questions here, so uh, let's hurry. Forward. <laughs> um, just maybe adding and asking uh, about the IPs that I'm um, two, three years ago, I agree with you that IP change would be bad. But nowadays it's a growing trend that IPs are coming. If you just look like Hansen Book, like a stone, Star Wars, Rebel Star, there's XCOM. There's legendaries, there's everything IP, and it's also only for business. And then there's a company called IDW that takes Ghostbusters and everything else. If you want to check IDW, then they do the IP thing very well. Um, and returning from two questions ago, I would say the strength of the board games is the people around you. So I would go there. Mm, and, well, you have the question, so I didn't ask them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there was a uh, next question, number two. You can come back, back to your question later if I miss it. Okay, this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm people when I'm a research director at Google School of Economics, and uh, since I'm a pretty good business researcher, um, I was wondering. Uh, can you mention what are the main differences and main similarities between the monetization of digital and physical games? And like uh, I think you said that quite a few people made a living out of designing physical games. But how these branches of game design can help each other to prosper and make more people happy and wealthy? Uh, thanks. Well, that's 
that's a that's a large topic. <laughs> I don't know if there is a, a, a three months. <laughs> like in uh, board games, in card games, I guess there is basically two monetization models. It's what we call in digital web to premium, so you pay and you get get that, and then you have the collectible card game, so you sell boosters. Correct. If, if there is more than this, uh, fill in like that. In uh, uh, video games or di digital games, there is all sorts of different uh, ways to monetize. Uh, you can show advertisements. You can have a thousand different ways to do free-to-play by selling uh, old coins inside the game and trying to shoot them. Uh, then sell either physical physical content or boosters or whatnot. Uh, and then of course also digital games have the premium model that you pay and then you get the game. And, but uh, in digital games you can also have a demo, uh, less, less, less common nowadays anymore. Uh, but uh, like I'd say that uh, when it comes to monetizing, uh, it's easier to do different different than just the premium way way because in board games and card games you still need the shop to sell that or you need to be super famous to get people to go to your website and order that physical game so and that's very limiting when it comes to what what types of uh, stuff is feasible to try to achieve because you need to have the physical setting setting uh, locations as well or well, you can do cheap ass games. Mm. Just yeah. bring them down. <laughs> yeah. all, that, all that people bring it down. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think both, both industries are very competitive and very kind of hard to. Hard to uh, they are very driven. I, I think both. If you mean board games as well, if you want to really make a living or even for the publishers, the big hits really matter. Like those who win the Arts or, or win big, big prizes, win big uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I have something else as well. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, but there is the whole, like, uh, I think also the manufacturing loop is kind of interesting because, uh, well, I, I think, uh, was it, was the Fantasy Flight Games did a full loop just recently? Like, I think it was during this week they announced that the dual board game is coming out. And I, that was the point where I thought, okay, oh, now I think I'm old, because didn't two board games just come out? But no, actually it was Doom 3 board game that came out, <laughs> which went into do the, there was like the Descent and Imperial Assault, and now it's kind of full loop because it's Doom again. So it's kind of like, obviously, nice games, nice teams, all that, but behind it is also the kind of manufacturing of like the components and stuff like that. And then, like, with the monetization side, like, one thing that came to my mind is the X-Wing stuff. So, obviously, you have, a, like, X-Wing miniature game, you bring in a lot of miniatures, then you do the, what's the epic version of X-Wing, which is the armor, and I think, which just scales up, so now you have multiple style destroyers and stuff, and then building kind of like an e-sport, well, not e-sports, but kind of like a competitive scene around it, similar to Warhammer, so you have, like, your uh, tournaments and stuff, and people just keep on buying figures. So, <coughs> one here, another uh, the other thing is the distribution, I think, is very uh, important, and that's a bit different in at least now the digital side, the free to play starts to kind of win the market, and then the distribution is very different than for uh, if you buy, if you go to a game stop and buy, buy console game, that's how then the distribution really matters there uh, in a like, physical or logistical way. <laughs> As it's in board games, so that means that the big companies uh, from the um, old school publish publishing side they can kind of push their products better in the distribution chain. And I think there has been a little bit of changes in the board game, and the hobby hobby market is of course always been a bit different. But uh, now the Kickstarters and everything, there's more channels. But still, on the board game side, I think that the distribution plays a big role. What what how much if if you can really make a living out of it, like for the for the publisher side at least. And the one, one of my favorites on the whole physical versus digital stuff is like the, you have like Skylanders, then you have Disney Infinity, so you have the, you have the digital like digital games and you have physical toys. And Disney just decided, yeah, we're gonna shutter uh, Infinity, which was like the games were really good, like nothing wrong with it, really well developed, really nice games. All the kids loved it, 
but they basically stumble on that like it's it's a really hard thing because now you've got kind of used to the digital world but here comes the physical one, so like you decide to have these toys, so now you need this much shelf space and you need the logistics and you need to ship that stuff. But then obviously who, who, who's the winner here, like who's done this logistics stuff way back when? Well, Lego. So Lego did the Lego dimensions and that's been selling like hotcakes. And they do it really well because they know how the shelf space stuff works. Then even if the Lego dimensions goes coupled, at some point you are still left with pretty limited edition Lego stuff that you can play and combine and all that stuff. So I think for Disney at least the Infinity thing brought some really harsh lessons about like you can have a really successful like digital game, but it, it's worth nothing if the logistics doesn't work on that physical side. Okay. Um. That is actually one big topic we're going to talk about the new era of the physical things or the already past era of that kind uh, or so. But let's talk about digital, uh, digital games now. So uh, we talked about physical games like how they are social and uh, cheaper to make, basically. Uh, but what are the best aspects of the digital games? What can you make into the games that you can't make? And I understand it's a broad. Uh, there's lots of like console games, mobile games, whatnot games. Like there's lots of different games into the other side. But like, still like few aspects that are really good, and really easy, or really like they really work into the other field. Yeah. Well, one as, as I said, one big thing is that most mo video games are basically single playerish type games. And and for those, I think one big benefit for video games is that they, because of the computer, because the AI, they can. Uh, the gameplay can be uh, balanced with the player skill level, basically. So you can make the game feel just the right amount of challenge for the player, and that kind of balancing is very difficult to do on board games. Of course, the other players balance each other out, but basically the game can add up to the player behavior, and that's that's one one big thing. Just as an example, there are probably yeah. that zillions of different things. Yeah. And yeah, on, on the kind of flip side of that, with the board games, like. There are examples of board games where the players themselves, like depending on your experience level, they can kind of shaft the game quite a lot, like Puerto Rico and its sitting order. And if, if you have like a if you have a newbie guy sitting on your left, then the guy on the right is like he's like he has a lot, lot of advantage on that because the newbie doesn't know what what he's going to be on his turn and so on and so on. So. That's a complete answer. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, uh, all of you guys are now working uh, with digital games, uh, probably working some physical games too, maybe. Uh, but, um, like, Toko, you started with, with physical games, if I got it right. <laughs> so, uh, should you, should, uh, because part of the cost. Games uh, like the program is uh, this is targeted for people who are interested about making games and interested about uh, this also for people who want to make games and want to promote make it even for a career. So is it a good place to start? Is it is it a good idea to do your uh, board games or card games if you like to be uh, in in a game industry even in digital? Uh, Side at some point. What's the best idea? The best idea. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you know, right there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was actually almost saying when you asked what are the benefits from the or well, not benefits, but the like the good things about board games platform and, and for developing games, I think it's a very good platform because as as you uh, maybe said about the iteration cycle is so much fast that that you can do something and and try it out, see if it works next day or even the same night if you do another version of it, try it out. It's almost impossible to do with the digital games because the uh, cycle to develop the game takes so long. So if you think from the designer's perspective, you can learn very slowly on the digital side because it may be half a year of development time, then you see, okay, shit, this, this great idea didn't work out. <laughs> and then you are, okay, I learned it, but okay, it was a half a year learning. And from the board game side, it's much, much faster. So I think that's, that's very big and, and real benefit for for designers, they can iterate so much faster and learn. So while you're sitting here, just go design your board games and card games, uh, do you have anything to add? To no, I, I just uh, want to emphasize that I 
have never agreed anything more than what I said. Excellent. Yeah, I've, I've been recruiting people uh, myself, and it's I often there are many people who like to be game designer, but they still don't have anything to show. And I think that's a one more good way to show that you have the uh, communication skills and logical skills to actually make a rule set, make a game. Uh, uh, yeah, I made my first board game like earlier this year, and it was it was mind blowing. Like, it was really interesting to make a game your, yourself, and like really think the whole process. And like it was it was hard for me to show the first version to people. It was like it was too late when I showed it to people already. So uh, my my giveaway show it as early as possible, but it's a little bit difficult in my opinion to to know when it's ready to be shown. Because if it doesn't work at all, it's, you don't really get any good feedback. That's same with digital games. But at least your digital game doesn't run and it crashes every one second if it's really, really in the making, so to say. But, but with, when can you find the, when is the moment to first try it out? I'd say show it as early as possible. If you think that you can play it yet, Offer your friend a beer or invite them just to talk about that. How are you planning to make the make the gameplay, but the, as early as possible? And don't waste your own time so much that uh, you safeguard it all, but it's not ready. I don't want to get the uh, constructive feedback how to make this better. But show it as early as possible. And if and if you're in a lock position that I don't know how this should work, then try it out or get people to talk about it. Uh, and offer a movie ticket or indeed invite a gig over a beer and then they will help out and then you're one step closer to making a great game. So definitely never to it, I would say. Yeah, I, I think this is one of my kind of favorite topics in a way. Because um, it doesn't matter if it's board games or digital, like it's just important that you actually finish something and then the ability to finish something actually even if it's shit, it means that you have some idea of like scope management and like you wouldn't, you can guess how many times when I talk to like, for example, some students who are gonna get onto this for the first time and kind of listen to the pitches and stuff. Like it's always like, yeah, so I'm gonna do like a, it's kind of like Hearts of Iron with Master of Orion and Diplomacy and stuff. And then there's like, you go to the planet and there's the first person, shorter version of that. And then it's like, okay, and it's ready by autumn. And then it's, then it's just like, okay, well, have you considered maybe cutting the first version shooter part out? So, so there, there's a lot of that. And then I think we used to, we used to do this a lot in digital chocolate, but like when recruiting game designers, and it's part of it is just for fun. It's not meant to be that serious. But obviously, you can imagine that some people get kind of like antsy about it. Like we used to do stuff like, we, we gave a we gave a kind of like a game designer candidate like two decks of cards, two pens, a rubber band and a dice, and then we left him into the room for one hour and like yeah can it make us a game and then we come back you know like one hour and see what has happened. So it's it's not like it's not like you need to do like the next multi billion seller card game, but it's just like you do something and you and then we can kind of see how you kind of think about things and if something shit how would you fix it and we thought about it and so forth and so forth. So it's just like kind of like keep going, keep iterating. If you can't finish anything then I think that's some kind of a sign that you should kind of think like or just try to do smaller things. And and one thing I want to emphasize also is that the idea is not yet a game. If you just have an idea but you can't explain how it's gonna work or how it's gonna play out, you don't have have a game. Once you start uh, see, once you know how it should work, how the rules go, then slowly you start to have a game. But an idea that indeed if you take like first person shooter combined with the uh, horror theme and that so forth, that's not yet a game. That's not a game idea yet. That's, that's Idea, but it's not. Yeah. Regarding Rego's point, I think it's very fine balance. Like if you look, lots of uh, board game hobbyists, uh, designer hobbyists, they, or we all, are, I guess, board game hobbyists. But anyway, like if you, there are two problems. One problem is that you never finish anything, and the other problem is that you don't, you never kill anything. You just 
do the same game over and over again and never let it go. And I actually kind of think that it's better just to always start a new project because that way you at least learn something. Of course, it's important every now and then to finish yeah. something as well. But for the learning process, it's I think, very good to just do something, see if it works out. If there's potential, continue forward. If not, kill it, start a new one. Don't feel too much love in your, your games. I think it's very important. Yes, and I learn very fast. And I, I'd say that uh, it's also good to have several projects going on at the same time. Because if you run into a dead end with something, then you can go back to the other one, and maybe that opens your clock, that you can then go back to the first one and then fix that. So I wouldn't like. Indeed, if, if you have just one great master master game that you want to uh, polish forever, then uh, that might take forever. But if you have several that you can then jump on, and then you actually might end up uh, where Reco said, finish stuff. And I also agree wholeheartedly with that. Finish. Yeah, and certainly like all your abandoned projects, they're kind of like sitting in the shelves. So sometimes that can be your toolbox. So you are you start a new project and you couple of months into it and then you realize, oh yeah, the one thing I was thinking for this game here actually might be this one here, so yeah. Okay. Um, so, there's um, one question. Oh yeah, question. Uh, where's the mic now? Who's called the mic? Yeah. Game of past the mic. Yeah. Um, can I ask a small question about the um, uh, testing of, uh, especially testing of physical games? Um, like, uh, I was wondering, uh, how do you actually use that, or do you have some sort of common, um, common manners, for example, that uh, the test players to uh, team fill out, so that, uh, so, uh, shortly, do you use the uh, um, team cloud protocol or coding walkthrough method or, or heuristics or something like that as a part of testing? I'm not sure, did I completely did I understand what I meant? So, did you mean that when you develop a physical board game, do you use some uh, like a external um, I don't know, idea of a well, set, like a methods of testing. Yeah, methods of testing. Yeah, like some sort of um, uh, like you know, typical common methods, uh, manuals that, um, or uh, you just like uh, tell the you know, PS players to just like okay. write out and play the game and see how how it works out. Okay, yeah, so it's basically can you design a spreadsheet or do you have to find a balance by playing up in, in a way? I, 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 I don't think it's possible to make some game theory. I, I have never seen it work actually, any game theory stuff like it on, on high level or anything like that. And on, on spreadsheet, you can of course do a lot of testing on the design phase that you can think about. Like, I, I wouldn't say that much actually, but you can do some, some testing on the, on the like spreadsheet phase, but I actually think that the, it's important to have these ideas in your mind when you develop a game, so that you have the uh, somehow feeling of the game, like <coughs> dynamics. But then you have to get put the game out and play it, play it with other other players to get the feedback, so you can then maybe change some numbers and parameters. But overall, it's it's mostly about the intuition in the end and about player player responses. Yeah, but I think there was something in the question also about the, like, did you ask like, uh, do you, and do you want players to kind of talk out, out loud when they are? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so yeah, that's the kind of testing phase. Actually yeah, yeah. Was like, uh, I guess yeah. also the, like, I, I don't know, how, how was it with Eclipse? Like, I, I remember you, you brought one of the prototypes to people shortly, and then you, you kind of explain the rules, and we start playing, and I, I think everyone there was a kind of game designer or something, so there was a bit of like, I got really lucky with the and stuff, so I got really powerful chips and stuff. Did you ever, like, once you had the kind of like, 
semi-final draft of the rule book, like did you like get the gang together and just throw the rule book on the table and then just go for a beer? <laughs> okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, of course, blind testing I think is very important for the final products to try out that kind of stuff. And yeah. yes, we did that. And also, okay, now I maybe understand better. So you can. For example, boy, I, I, I've seen a lot of people doing this kind of uh, answer to, after the playtest session, you, you write some feedback on paper and, and then there's some questions about it and kind of gather the feedback in that way. I, I think it can work. I, I have actually never used it, that kind of methods. But uh, of analyzing, the, let's say from, from Eclipse testing, at some point we started to collect the, like the who played which, which species and what were the scores and find out balances. And you can use that kind of data mining in a way. But, but yeah, I think still the most valuable thing is the response of the player when you just see them playing and see the problems they are facing and, and you maybe write some notes for yourself and ask some question, how did you feel about this, was this confusing? Yeah, yeah well, I you can pass the mic. I was just, I was just, I just want to ask you that you don't believe in automatic, automated testing in like card games or board games. Do you think it's not worth it? Worth it? question a little bit. Now, uh, the user interface is in games, both digital and physical board games. Now, I'm not a game designer by any stretch, but I'm a UI designer, so I tend to notice certain kinds of things, like how in Arkham Horror, uh, things are completely in wrong order in the card from a usability perspective, because they're not definitely presented in the order they occur in the game. And like good things, like in, in Small World or Third and Taxes, the visual design supports very well learning that makes the components look consistent and score always is this same shape and things like that. So how do you guys as game designers think of the UI or sort of the usability angle? Is that completely indistinguishably tied to the game design or is that kind of a separate thing? How would you think about that? And also related to, uh, of course, it's in playtesting. I'm guessing that you're more looking for game design kind of learnings from game, game testing. But of course, there's also usability things. What do you think on that? Yeah, very good question, actually. I think the UI is, the usability is super important in, in, in both designs, like in physical and, and visual. And uh, maybe. From the, at least from my perspective, I think maybe even from the visual side, there uh, many depends. Many times the uh, user interface design, you know, I would say maybe even even more important in some cases that you have to think about the experience from the what can be there's, there's so limited amount of space on screens usually, especially on mobile devices. What can happen there? What the interaction should work? But they really tie into the gameplay mechanics as well. Yeah, there's there's an old saying that like because in the digital side you kind of outsource stuff, so you have some agents to do the concept art and whatever. So there's this saying that never outsource your UI design, and it's like it's it is it's it's really really super tough. Like I I like, I agree totally that it is in my experience it is one of the hardest things on a project to kind of get right, and it takes time and it's. There's, there's, there's a lot, a lot of, lot of stuff. But I think for Arkham Horror, like, that's just the Amory Thrash thing, like, it doesn't have to make sense. So it's just part of the part of the DNA. Like, you're part of the cult when you play Arkham Horror. Yeah, um, yeah and, and there, there's, I'm kind of just, I think there's some interesting things in, in board games, and this is, again, like, I'm really old because this feels really new to me. But, you guys remember the trend that started with the uh, chaos in the old world? They started using those sliding cardboard things that you, you can kind of see the number and then you kind of slide those and then battles are galactically data. And it, that's an interesting thing because that's also like user interface, but there's obviously many ways you can convey that same information. But for those games, it was like kind of really elegant and I'm glad someone brought it up like uh, when, they, when they start designing those. Yeah. I think there's been more of that kind of innovation for you know, yeah. the gimmick side of, of that side has been really, uh, for example, the, what was it called, the, with the moving, moving wheels there, yeah, there's check games, 
try to talk and talk. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good example of that kind of that it, I think has become even more important than board games because the gameplay mechanic space has been explored so much already. So the next phase, because the production is uh, is maybe easier nowadays to do plastic models and whatever, and, and they, that's really gone gone forward. So there's a lot of innovation happening on the uh, on the, like, the physical uh, experience side of the, on the board games. And, those dials and, and yeah. all, all of that stuff are good examples of that. And uh, I also think, like, coming back to our camera writing there, what's the studio? It's Fantasy Flight. No, it's yeah. the Fantasy Flight. Yeah, so I think, like, our camera was released in 2005, and after that, you got, like, the uh, what was it, the mansion thing and the, the Eldritch Horror. And I think already Eldritch Horror is kind of like Arkham Horror, but just got a different scope. But it's a way more like usable because it kind of makes a bit more sense. But I, I think it's also been a learning experience for Fantasy Flight in terms of how to do things because the yeah, Arkham Horror is just like, what? <laughs> they still can't, don't know how to write manuals though. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you think, just a quick question about that, so it was worth actually releasing the first game, he made with bad UI, so they could take the learnings of it and make the next game better. Is it? Yeah, you can, yeah, 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 you can patch that egg like forever, like you have to redo yeah. the, yeah, I mean it's, I, I think that's, a, it's a, it's a bit of a common thing, like there is that thing that sometimes, I guess because on the digital side, the sequels are actually a bit better than the first one, so there is that. You have your time to market and then it's out and hopefully it does well, and if it does well, then you can iterate from that one word to make it a bit better. Yeah, but I, I would still add that all the board games also still need, do need an artist. So better, better have a good artist who understands it, the UI. That, uh, good example of, or bad example is the club that uh, I made way back in the back the years. And with a bit more careful thought, we, we could have got rid of, rid of a whole component by just a better UI design on the background, background of the tiles. That we could have had all the information there, and then this super horrible uh, score, score sheet could have been a lot more simple. And uh, we did that with the expansion, but the, the mistake was, was already made that the, the vast majority of the games out there had confusing score chart, which, which was totally unnecessary. So if we had given a better thought on the flight uh, on launch, then it would have been a lot more successful. Also, also uh, how many copies it would be sold. Yeah, and, and, and there is like definitely the business side of that as well. Like if you kind of think about it, like if you're doing a board game, it's not just the board but all the components, and then you actually have to figure out the like, okay, so how big is the box? How, how big are the cardboards there? How many layers of cardboard? How many? How thick is the cardboard? And all that stuff, and then all just adds to the kind of dimensions of it, and it costs more. And then like, okay, so does it all have to be cardboard? Is there something we can kind of get out of it? Like those are actually, especially when you are kind of, I think on the kind of, on the road to actual printing stuff out department, like you, you will have a lot of questions on that side, like and a lot of like compromise on how, to, how can you kind of make it work because it's all basically money, like the cardboard thickness and how much of it is in that and so on and so on. Yeah, it's, it's good to take into account like this like, game already, yeah. but what kind of what it means if it is something very crazy in mind, no one might be able to publish. One thing I think is interesting, what has changed in the kind of, well, in past 10 years or something, that the board game production have become uh, multi, uh, like um, they, they, they usually now uh, publish the same game in different languages at the same time. And I think that has changed a little bit about how, how especially the this UI design is, so that from the design perspective, it's better to have these kind of uh, cards and symbols that can be uh, can be done with single uh, sheet, so you don't have to do any uh, localization, basically. So that way, Nowadays, many of the games have only stream blocks in them, and I think that affects a little, little bit about how the game should be designed as well, because you cannot convey everything in symbols. Some things can, some things cannot. And if you are able to make a game that is only using symbols, it's a much better chance to get published, because a lot of companies do this cross-country uh, publishing. That's something maybe to take into account, and I, I think that's 
even made the good UI design uh, more important in a way because you can't write the text and say this car does that because then you will need to translate it to other languages. So what's the panel's verdict on race against the galaxy or the race for the galaxy? Race for the galaxy. Yeah, race for the galaxy. Because that they basically took the whole iconization like I think the first yeah, yeah. the next level. Yeah, I guess but there's actually some text on the cards. Yeah, so I mean, there is a yeah. 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 I think there it's just a usability thing, but it's yeah. kind of like a coding language that you have to learn. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's the best game. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There was a question there. Well if you can pass the mic. The question is how do you get the maximum visibility for a game? For example, in the digital side, there are so many games that it might be a little bit even to find, find your game. Do you have a panel for that? It's a big question as well. Big question. Is it, is it just for digital? Or both, both. Both, okay. Can it can can be, can be, can be, can be like, literally, is it possible to make this brief? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that it, this is worth the whole, whole panel. Uh, but, uh, it's a big, big topic. Of course, in the, well, these guys know that they're working with the mobile free to play, but uh, there uh, you can have, like, if you have big enough muscles, then you can also buy the visibility, uh, which for the mobile side is very, very, very important that someone actually hears, hears about your game. Of course, to some extent, you can do that on the PC side as well. Uh, but but no, not as much as well. If you can't pay for too much for the visibility on the store, so the store itself, if you're selling uh, premium games, but for free to play, you can see from the monetization that uh, if I put, put euro uh, to get a get a get a user, do I get it back uh, from that user? So you can balance it out nicely in mobile mobile games. Uh, then, other, other, other than that, and having journalists write about your game, trying to like, the regular marketing that uh, someone needs to do, either the publisher or if it's a hobby project, then you yourself need to try to contact and spread the word for the, for the hobbyist somehow. And uh, getting your game reviewed, that's one way to get it. I think there's so much stuff. Yeah, I have one short but Just use Pokemon license. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a huge topic. Yeah, like it's. I I I'm thinking like should I just start talking about it? <laughs> yeah, it, it would have been, like can, can we like just what's the board getting? I know like it was hard because basically you have the whole logistics thing. How do you get the biggest place on the show? Yeah. Uh, well, there's the distribution, yeah, and the logistics side. I think finding a good publisher that has a good relationship is yeah. very important. And also from the hobby, hobby side, oh, and winning Spiel des Jahres. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, getting, getting any, any kind of, the Spiel des Jahres, of course, the biggest, uh, as Deutsche Spiel des Prize, the Spiel Prize as well. But even the like, domestic uh, board and bedding, yeah. you know, that helps, helps a lot. Getting some kind of recognition that this is a good game yeah. instantly helps. Yeah. And from, I think, the internet has opened up a lot of possibilities. Let's say if you on board game geek or something like that, you can do you can do something there and like spread out the game in a viral way that people really start start, start talking about something and, and uh, yeah, I think like actually I was looking at it, but I, I think like on like you have Indiegogo or Kickstarter and stuff like that, and I think those guys were actually saying that the actually board games are doing quite well on those. Yeah. Like in comparison to, for example, when you're doing like it's starting your digital game and then it's like still two years and nothing's come out and no one's telling you anything. But I think like the kind of like the history on the board game is starting in the Google stuff has been quite good. And there's a nice trickle effect because then you get your there's the board game geek entry and then people start talking about it there and it can I there's so many board games that have come onto my radar just like, oh wow, it was Kickstarter, or it was Indigo. That's, that's a bit uh, different still because in, uh, for board games, they are usually finished games. If, if, like, since one person basically or, uh, can make a game, then they are like you, they're usually not uh, asking for money to actually design a game, but they already have something. Whereas for digital games, you need to. Yeah, it's usually 
that we then we're going to finish this game and it's you know, sort of maximum halfway through or something, then it, it's bigger risk for the for the whoever is funding us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're going to have a panel about this tomorrow. Basically, not not only this, but uh, it's business money and gamers like. Well, it's going to be only on this, like. Yeah, because we're not going to be on this. Yeah. Only, basically, only about this. Yeah, free speaking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's here tomorrow at one. Uh, we're going to moderate it again. Um, so um, one brief question um, for the, and then the final question. It's surprising that we can run out of time in two hour slots. That's awesome. Uh, so, uh, I started with Reco here. Uh, so, I understood when I saw you talking earlier that you're still working. Like, I understood you have like an artistic background, basically. Yeah. And yeah. I heard you, you draw. Uh, you still draw by hand, but working with the, the design and the game team. Yeah, yeah. My, my stuff is quite illustrative. That's awesome. So you're the, you're the uh, visual, you try to go in the idea visually. Yeah. And like, you had an interesting thing, uh, points like many years ago when I heard it, uh, why, you're, and why you're doing it by hand and not by any illustrators or like other visual. Yeah, well I guess when you are, when you have a background in like 3D graphics and kind of like digital illustration and all that stuff and then, yeah. And, and you can do stuff quite fast. At one point, there was this thing that when I was drawing things on a computer and kind of like just visualizing how things look, that actually can kind of like step on the feet of like the actual artist who are supposed to do the assets. And there's, I, I never had any incidents, but it just started to bother me that my stuff was kind of influencing their work so much because that wasn't the point. So it was just to like give an idea like how should the feedback work and to like maybe have particles here. Let's have anticipation on this animation and blah 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 blah. But it's just like yeah. It's, and then I just did the whole Photoshop. Now I'm just doing stuff with I just draw it ink and markers and color it and then take photo and phew, there it is. So you get the same idea, but it doesn't. You can't replicate that on a kind of like a digital like Photoshop. So it's a small thing. But yeah. So you're all working with digital, digital games now. Uh, do you have like physical things like this that you still use? Working, we're working with digital games. So is there something that's really helps your workflow? Uh, do you like hyper prototype prototypes or do you use some methods like that in your work these days? Uh, I, I at least rarely use paper prototypes unless I'm doing board game. <laughs> but uh, I, I have I've found that it's it's not it's it's not many times too useful to do those work unless they really take the game mechanics somehow are natural or then. But uh, of course using just no actually nowadays I'm I'm using like the pro with a pencil but that's that's <laughs> my own yeah that's now replacing the old school notebook perhaps but let's see but a notebook and pen and paper that's the that's the best friend of that designer. Yeah I totally agree pen and paper are particularly at the early stage of their production they are, they are invaluable. I'd say or at least I don't use digital stuff at the record, like pre-production. Well, I'm halfway to the pre-production, I then start using the Excel and the uh, Word documents. But, uh, but uh, writing quickly, designing quickly, yes. so that's at least what I do. Sometimes I do use, use uh, paper prototypes, but usually it's more to explain for the programmer that okay, th these are connected that way. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't say that they are not always what the game itself, but rather part of my, my explanation and kind of like the creative process that uh, I can show that, okay, this is how things are going to work. So uh, not in the same sense as indeed making a board game and having the first prototype there, but, but similar, do you say? Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely you don't want to kind of force the thing like it. it it's not, it feels that the prototype doesn't kind of fit this part in the project, then don't do it. But there's like, for example, in Little Shock, we had a, we have this game called Power Blocks, which is this kind of reaction game where you kind of build powers and you try to make them as high as possible. And then there were many iterations of that. And then at one point we thought, that, okay, so could we just actually do something new, new this thing? 
So there was a game called Park Blocks New York, which is basically you developing Manhattan. And that was basically, we had the same kind of like the core game was the same. You are basically doing this Jane Nice tower and you're trying to stack it higher and higher. But then outside of that, the meta game was actually building Manhattan, like thinking about like which kind of a building, uh, like is it commercial or is it like uh, industry or something, and you are basically trying to build the Manhattan thing. And that was like invaluable to prototype on an actual board game because now you are basically, you don't need to care about the actual core game, but you are just prototyping the meta game and how it works. And that was super important because like the IP itself was really valuable for the company itself because it had always done well and it was one of the flagships and so on. So they don't want anyone to screw that up. So then if you imagine that you are the only way you can pitch this new addition into this game is by just talking about it, no one is gonna like take that because everyone understands that a different way. But if you can prototype it and hey, well here you play it and let me know what you think. So that was like that was really eye-opening because like then the comments actually turned around that holy shit, this is actually quite fun, let's do this. So you need to kind of pick your battles when it comes to this prototyping thing. But yeah, it can be worth it. But so sometimes I think what makes sense, uh, not really a prototype, but just do a sketch for each of the kind of screens in a way like you can put yeah. them together. So it's, it's more like almost like an interactive thing, like a booklet where you can play the game by just turning the page. I think that can work sometimes, depending on the game, but yeah. then you can visualize that. You can say now you push this button and then you turn the page and see what's next screen and doing that kind of exercises, that's that's many times helpful. Yeah. Yeah, we used to do a lot that a lot with some of the like first time user yeah. like in the first experience, like kinda of like the first couple of minutes, you know, actually just stack of paper and with the layout or read it or whatever, and then you just gotta see where the guy presses and then you can move onwards. So yeah, that kind of work. Yeah. Yeah, but, and for me, in the latest project that I'm working at the moment, when we were reaching the verticals wise, which is the first version that should give the experience out, uh, it was super helpful that uh, when everyone was super busy, we have been behind schedule since the beginning of the project. Uh, is, <laughs> uh, I think the best, best thing I did at that stage was creating like a 40 slide uh, PowerPoint presentation where I took the UI artist that just joined the team, made me buttons, and then I just explained that how, where everything should work. And that set us uh, like on the path, or on the right path for the entire team when we didn't have much yet. It was just uh, like uh, in two months we need to be able to show some, something. So how, how, how should things work? So that was really, really helpful. Yeah, it was in a PowerPoint format, but very close to uh, paper prototype. Okay, uh, we have five minutes left, so it's time to start the last big topic. No way. Uh, so <laughs> I, what, I think it's a good, good place, place to finish this kind of panel. Like, the, uh, let's talk briefly about the new physical era that is. Uh, Coming like your most accurate interpretations of future, like when we see like augmented reality games. Somebody, some of you might have heard about Pokemon Go, uh, <laughs> Ingress that has been uh, like Shadow Cities, uh, but now, especially after Pokemon Go, like augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, gadgets, uh, all kind of gadgets and extra tools like Skylander that we talked about earlier, and Lego, what Lego is doing. So, what do you think? Are we gonna? What, what, well, where should we start? Uh, this is one big problem. Um, so what is the big problem right now with those games? And <coughs> is, there a, is it possible we see them solved uh, in next, uh, like, soon, so to say? In a way, like, one, one big thing is, of course, the platform needs to exist in order to make games. Mm -hmm. And I don't think those, well, I guess you can say that Pokemon Go has an augmented reality, but really, you would need some classes to probably do that, and that that kind of is missing still. But whenever it comes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that augmented reality will be big in a way for games as well. Maybe we, we are probably, this is just my guess, will be more niche, it will probably have a place, but maybe not in a way that many, many <coughs> today. Uh, but yeah, whatever happens, like mobile phones, they weren't made, made for gaming, but that platform supports gaming, so then whatever the platform happens to exist, then the games 
people start naturally evolving and, and the games that uh, use the advantage of the platform for the for them they, they will usually succeed better. So I, I, I in a way I, I see more like the platform comes first and then games and not the other way around. But of course sometimes the games can also support the platform and because of the game grows big, but I think that's more rare. Yeah, and I, uh, one thing I love is that whenever there's a new platform, like the first first guys always get it wrong. Like, it's it's kind of weird, like when when the iPads were coming, like everyone was talking about, yeah, finally there's another really nice platform for board games. And then like when when the smartphones came out, then you had a you actually had like some power that you could do, like do like good games on it. Then the thing was that, yeah, finally we can do like, I'm a hardcore game, I'm gonna make my PC game, but I'm just gonna do it on a smartphone. So it's like, every time there's a new platform, the kind of idea of how people are gonna use the platform, and what, is, what, what are the kind of locations where you can use, that's kind of thrown out of the window, because obviously smartphones aren't made for this kind of like, I'm just gonna play 30 minutes and no one else, I'm not gonna care about anything else. So and it's, it was interesting, like one paper shot, one was doing this. They had a, like a 50 minute episode where they went through all the Oculus Rift demo stuff. And it was just hilarious to watch that because, like, they had like 25 crossbow games there. I wanted some kind of bow games, and the guy was just bored out of his mind. And they had my head hurts, like, could someone take this off? And they, they, everything was like really similar, really crappy. And all those long bow games cost like $50 or something, and they just like awful. So it's it's really interesting to see like what is the hit on VR or what like what is the hit on AR or what Pokemon, but yeah. And then what one problem is obviously like the antics making so much money that they can store it anywhere. So it's just like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the, uh, personally, I think uh, the physical uh, like renaissance will be when. Uh, 3D printing is so cheap that it will solve for the pro board games also the distribution cha the challenges. That when there is the, the print and play to the next level, that uh, anyone could sell as many copies anywhere when there is shops that print in hardware games or, or whatever other products as well. I think that's going to change uh, change gaming at least as much as the VR is going to change. That is basically what the iPod did for the digital uh, games. Yeah, so the same kind of will happen with the board games when printing, 3D printing becomes cheap. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you kindly for this panel. It was super interesting, at least for me. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you all for all the questions you had. And I think that's it. <laughs>